GM GM everyone and welcome back to a weekly episode of We in Web3, a podcast about you, me, them. Basically people who are building the future of Web3 and reshaping the way we interact in the digital ecosystem, from early developers to newcoming celebrities and advocates. I'm your host Nikita Tsikaluk and as always we're building the space by people for people. Today, my guest is an amazing Ovi Farouk. Uh, for the majority of Web3 Dagant, he is also known as OSF. Uh, when mentioning his background, there is almost no company Ovi is not connected with. He's an artist for his uh, Rag Guy collection. He's a famous host at Rag Radio, a good friend of Farouk. Mando. He's also a co-founder of Dagens NFT and Canary Labs uh, XYZ together with uh, Mando. And uh, there's a lot of things that uh, I would like to discuss with you here today, uh, my friend. Uh, so I'm really happy to see you at my podcast. Hey. Yeah. Hey, man. How's it going? Pleasure to be here. The same here. Uh, I should address the fact that uh, I invited both you uh, and Mando uh, here today to discuss the topic of uh, being a true Dagon uh, in the Web3 space, uh, the current uh, environment of NFT market and uh, the future trajectory from it. Uh, I should say, fortunately, Mando is not here uh, today with us because he's having uh, perhaps the biggest mint of his life. Uh, he's uh, waiting for a burst of his... Uh, per skid very soon. Uh, so he's not here today with us, uh, but I hope that Monday gonna join us uh, next time. So today uh, you have a very big task. Uh, you'll be replying for both guys. Uh, a lot of questions coming in your side, my man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ready for it. <laughs> ready for it. I guess uh, the first thing that uh, my audience would like to know, and that's something that uh, you told me when we first connected back in September uh, during uh, Web3 London week, during Zebu Life, uh, when I connected with you and some other amazing builders in London. Uh, the first thing that I had is what is your connection with Mondo? Uh, so you said that uh, you're best friends. You said that you used to work together. You said that if I'm not mistaken, you even studied together. So you're like... Uh, uh, school friends, you're from a very early age. Uh, so let me know a bit more about uh, your connection with Mando and how did you decide both to uh, join the space itself? Yeah, I actually met Mando through work. So we both started working at Barclays together uh, as traders. Um, so I started on the high yield trading desk in london in 2012 and then michael uh started in 2013 so um that's about 10 years ago now maybe nine years ago that since we first met and since we've known each other and you know on these trading desks they're very small people sit shoulder to shoulder i sat next to him for about six years while i was in london so we, we became very good friends uh through that basically and then i spent some time in new york came back to london we spent more time in london but um we've been very good friends for yeah almost a decade basically this is huge. This is definitely huge uh, from the strong friendship coming from one environment. And I do believe that uh, this traditional finance, uh, trading environment, banking, uh, that's where uh, real friends uh, can be found because you go through all these ups and downs and uh, you know the person. And that's why when you decide whether I want to build something uh, bigger, something special with him or her. Uh, so in case uh, of you uh, and Mando, uh, what was your uh, financial background, uh, like financial expertise before coming to the Web3 space? And how uh, did it help you to better understand the space? Because if I'm not wrong, uh, you started uh, with crypto, uh, with some uh, altcoins, like basically understanding the space, because that, that is the most obvious way to start in Web3. That is the closest one for traditional finance. And I do believe only after that you started digging deeper into all other aspects of Web3. So let, let, let us know what was your background in this traditional finance and how, if at all, uh, it helps you to better understand the Web3 space. Yeah, I mean, look, we were traders. Um, we traded high yield and distressed credit. So we traded bonds and we also traded CDS, so credit derivatives. Um, and in that product, you have to have a strong understanding of all things financial markets. So um, our careers were taking risk and figuring out ways to, I guess you can 
consider it as investing in different companies. Um, we also could short different companies as well. So you look at things from both the long and the short side. And um, from our careers, we really learned and the idea of like appraising investments and figuring out whether something would be a good trade or a bad trade and, and taking a position and sizing the risk appro appropriately ahead of that. So that was our background. Um, when we looked at crypto and looked at NFTs, you know, it's a different market. Like crypto in itself is a completely different asset class to, to credit. Um, there are some similarities in, in the way it trades. There's a lot of volatility, like high yield and distressed companies can move very aggressively and very violently in a short space of time. You get that same aspect in crypto. And then for NFTs, it's an over the counter market. So you can't just go into an exchange and always get a price for it. You have to find a buyer or find a seller. You have to line up these trades and you know, trading credit was the same thing. There was no exchange where we could go on and get instant liquidity. You actually had to um, hustle a little bit to find the, the buyers or sellers. So there are a lot of similarities, maybe not in like what the assets themselves were, but a lot of similarities in how they traded. And um, 10 years of doing it, I think was a, was a great, um, uh, you know, experience and great preparation for, for entering the, the Web3 world. I love it. Uh, how, how can you describe your first experience with crypto? Because uh, in the majority of cases, and here I'm all, also talking about my case, uh, people are going through big downs, uh, especially if they're leveraging, most probably, especially if it's during bear market, people have no idea of uh, the cycles understanding of the technology and at the beginning uh, all you need is uh, to hear like Matt Damon's advertisement on TV uh, to get into crypto. Uh, that's how a lot of my friends uh, actually got there through some advertisement, through some uh, word of mouth. In your case you've been um, in a very let's let's say less risky, less volatile market but still you were in the market. You knew uh, how, how it's uh, there to be out there with all these big shards and I even know that uh, Amanda who is not here today with us uh, he's posting uh, big announcements in the equity market in the bond market whenever there is a job report whenever uh, whenever there is a, a GDP quarterly results so I'm following Mando because he's one of the first one to give some updates before after so it seems like you guys are still uh, into this topic, uh, which allows you uh, into this field, which allows you to make uh, less risky, uh, more knowledgeable decisions here. And it was also the case for you, I do believe, at the beginning. So how did you start with your crypto? Was it uh, all in uh, one specific uh, asset? Was it uh, some diversification or you weren't investing in crypto at the beginning? You were just uh, learning about it and uh, trying to find out this uh, perfect protocol in your case or whatever. Yeah, I started, my first purchase was Bitcoin. I bought Bitcoin. Um, the idea was that it was just like a, not a hedge against inflation. It was an inflation trade. I think people have a misunderstanding of crypto being like an inflation hedge. I think that's not entirely true. I think it's an inflation hedge in an, in an environment where you have inflation and low interest rates, which is what we had last year and not what we have, what we've had this year. So um, that was the idea. We, we were trying to find um, interesting trades to do PA where, um, you know, we could ride this inflation narrative and um, Bitcoin was the most obvious one. So that's how I started. I bought Bitcoin in Jan 21. Then I discovered Ethereum and got involved in that. Um, and, you know, alongside Mando and I were both looking at the traditional art market or physical collectibles like wine, whiskey, et cetera, because they're also very, you know, inflation proof investments. Um, we then discovered NFTs, which is kind of like, okay, collectibles that are digital and that are stored on blockchain. So it was kind of like both of those things combined. And we figured like, you know, this would be as, as Mando likes to call it, this would be inflation squared. It would be like <laughs> both of these things and, and, a, you know, a huge magnitude of uh, order of effect um, on price action. So that was the reason why we got involved. Actually, we, you know, we've both been aware of crypto for a long time. We've both been crypto skeptic for a long time, um, but we had this kind of like top down macro view and that's why we decided to get into, uh, into NFTs. So, um, you know, we started off by buying one of ones on super rare. We then branched out into collectibles. Um, you know, we bought apes and punks, et cetera, and then um, you know, before we knew it, we were just fully, uh, fully immersed in the space. Who was the guy who actually said, uh, fuck it, I'm going to go all in. <laughs> I, 
I think um, it's a good question. I think I think we're both of that nature. I think um, we argue about this quite a lot. I think I was the first one to bring up crypto <laughs> as, as an idea. Um, to be fair to Manda, who was the first one who bought NFTs and you know, that's where we had our big wins. And I, I mean, Man Monday is not here, so you can say whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, um, I think after he, he was, a, he spends about a month in NFTs before, um, before I got involved. And yeah, like, I think two months in, we were like, yeah, let's just, you know, we should just go all, all in on this stuff, basically. I love it. And uh, I know that you have a very inspiring story perhaps not how you entered the nfts but how you became famous how you became big uh with uh board apes uh so i have heard this story a couple of times so uh can you share with the audience the story when you decided to uh go deep into the board ape uh, ecosystem and what, what was this aha moment when you actually realized that uh, the things that you were buying for what, what was the price and a couple of hundreds bucks uh, yeah. each something like this the thing started going like this as my, as you referred to mando saying uh, uh this hedge uh multiplied by two three five ten times what what, what was your story with word apes because for those people who don't know uh you as a co-founder of uh, canary labs xyz together with uh, two of your friends uh both of them, uh, one of them I met back in London, another one is uh, Mando, who is not here today with us. Uh, you are the fourth biggest holders of uh, Board Ape uh, Yacht Club on the chain. Yeah. So if I'm not mistaken, 72, am I right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Exactly. So meaning that uh, you have uh, most probably the equal amount of mutants, candles, and I remember you showing me your collection. It's not just some random stuff. It's actually have uh, golden ones. You have some uh, rare ones. So it's a cool story to share. So feel free to share it with us. Yeah, I was um, I was living in New York at the time and I just quit my job. I, was, I quit my job to move to a different bank to move back to London. Um, so I was kind of feeling, I don't know, I was, those days are quite stressful because the bank does everything that they can to try and retain you. You have to go through all these different interviews and talks and, you know, people who hired you or you've known for, for, for me, it was like seven, eight years at the time, uh, you know, trying to like keep you at the bank. So it's a very stressful day. So like I got home eventually, um, I think it was about 3 a.m. I basically couldn't sleep. And um, uh, having just had this like, kind of like stressful day, but relieving day, cause I'd, you know, resigned and everything. I knew I was gonna have three months off. Um, and you know in banking when you get three months off that time off is paid it's called gardening leave and when you join a new bank you get a bonus when you when, when you sign on so so you're paid um, from all sides <laughs> yeah I was, I was in a, i was in kind of like a good spot um and yeah i was just feeling a bit courageous and you know i was browsing i was literally just browsing twitter and i saw a bunch of people minting apes and at this point i hadn't bought any collectibles i didn't actually i didn't really believe in punks um i'd only bought one of ones on super rare and a lot of people talking about collectibles, PFPs and stuff at the time. And I remember people were pushing this narrative and we just didn't believe in them. We really didn't. And we saw a lot of these things, like people bought them and they went to zero and they're kind of just like a little bit rubbish. So um, at this point, I'd never really touched them before, but um, you know, I, I was browsing Twitter. I saw a bunch of people minting them. I went onto the website and this was the first website that I saw. It was like, it was just done so professionally. It was like, it was also the first NFT project that was phrased as a club or as a membership kind of thing. It was called the Bored Ape Yacht Club. Before that, everything else was like crypto punks or crypto skulls or ether rocks. Like there was this no like specific mention of an idea of a club or a members club. And whereas this was, and even though it wasn't completely clear at this point, like what type of club it would be, I was like, okay, like this is now interesting. Like this is maybe like a membership to something cool. And the website was just done so well. It was so professional and it just looked really legit, you know, like if I saw that now, I would definitely question it because there's so many things that look really, really legit that turn out to be scams. But up until this point, there was no other website that looked this legitimate apart from maybe punks, but even punks had a very simple website. So um, I know just like looking through it in the first few seconds, I just kind of got this like vibe and like, don't get me wrong, it was still a complete gamble, um, um, absolutely a complete gamble. But I... Um, you know, I minted a bunch. I looked at where they were in secondary, like the floor price was like way higher than where, where they were in primary. So then I just 
you know, kept hitting, hitting the mint button basically. And um, I could see it was going to sell out. Like, I could see every time I refreshed the screen, it was like another like 500 were minted. So, um, you know, I just minted as, as many as I could, which was 150 at the time. So it was still about 40 grand that I spent on, 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 on minting these. Wow. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's still pretty crazy. So um, what, what, what was your way of thinking after you minted, like the, mo the moment you minted and you're like, okay, so now I'm done, but like, this decent amount of money that I just got, that I just got from these banks where I was living at, uh, it's gone like this. And you know that a lot of, and basically it's your second NFT, basically it has this uh, one of one before. So is it a scam? Is it still to be there? Is it something new? Like what was your way of thinking after uh, paying all this money at once? Because that that is basically your, I, I do believe your first is big type of, uh, uh, payment in the web three yeah i think um at the time i knew they were going to go higher but i didn't know they would it would become what it became now so i wasn't sure if it was a scam i wasn't sure if it was like gonna actually pull through and be this huge thing i could just see there was like a lot of momentum and a lot of hype around it and it was it felt different to everything else so for me the idea was like okay i'm gonna mint a bunch of these and i'm probably gonna sell them all over the next few days if they're higher which is what i did and you know at the time it was, it was kind of like a good trade i made like between five and ten times my money on on all the stuff and in the space of a few days and like well you know that's a pretty good like return like I and, and, and you were like and, and you were like what were what was i doing in this bank like what, what was i spending my days yeah there yeah <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Well, it, I, it was that point as well where I realized like, wow, like you can really make a lot of money trading this stuff. And it's different now. Like it's so much harder now because number one, we're not in a bull market. Number two, um, there's so many different like tools and analytics that um, help people trade. So it strips out a lot of the alpha. But back then it was like, wow, I'm like trading like stuff that feels like I'm trading the same product as in my day job. But number one, it's on blockchain now. So all the information is public and I have access to it. Number two, I'm competing against people who don't have like 10 years of experience in the professional trading seat. So um, it was just like such a huge opportunity. And uh, like I said, like that opportunity no longer exists in my opinion because of a lot of different things. Um, but yeah, it was pretty, it was really, really insane. <laughs> so you definitely had this uh, competitive advantage uh, compared to like 99% of uh, yeah, the so. audience out there. Did you inform Mondo about the Mint uh, or you decided you mean yourself? Did. You did. Okay. No, so. I did. I texted. I was texting him. I was texting Keyboard Monkey, and I was like, "Hey guys, you should, you should mint this. Like, I've just got this feeling, it's gonna um, go higher." But you know, everyone says that to everyone, and I like every time someone says that to me, I never mint it because I'm just like, like Perfect. whatever. But um, uh, I was really, really being genuine, and Mando didn't mint it, and. Honestly, I would have done exactly the same thing in his position. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have minted it. Um, but um, yeah, it was just one of the like, every, you know, one in every twenty of those. They happen to be something that like that gets big. So, what was his reaction after uh, like a couple of days, a couple of weeks when we uh, when he seen uh, the floor price just rocketing? Was he regretting yeah, it? Yeah, he, he was okay. Yeah, look, I'm sure, I'm sure he regretted it. Um, who wouldn't? Like it's uh, it's one of those things. Um, it's funny because he was saying you should sell these because, you know, you should take the money and, and move on. This, you know, this is probably going to go back lower. And I kind of agreed with him. So I did. And, you know, like right after the apes came, me bits were coming. So I was like, well, now there's going to be like 20,000 new NFTs that by the CryptoPunks guys, these are going to be like way better than the apes. Um, so, yeah, I was like, sure, let me, you know, let me get rid of these. So it's funny when he decided to like buy a bunch of them back at like three or four ETH, a lot, lot higher than where okay. we sold them. But um you know, it was the right trade to buy them back because you could see what was happening. Like it was a huge, huge, um, huge movement in like the adoption of PFPs as an idea and concept. And um, you could see that you guys were very clearly number two at the time. Yeah, number exactly. one now. Number one, undeniably, definitely. So talking about day job, uh, when did you both uh, decide to move uh, full time into the Web3 space? When did you decide that uh, banking is cool, uh, but you know what, uh, there is something new happening? Uh, and actually when and what was this narrative? Was it like uh, this new Web2 
uh, transition into something bigger or it was just like your understanding that with my background in finance, in trading, and these things making like two X5, X10 uh, in a matter of weeks, uh, I can build something special here. Yeah, it's a good question. So we we first talked about leaving in like March or April, 2021. And um, we really thought about it. So it's very, quite early. And then we decided against it. We decided against it because we're like, well, this is too early. We don't really know if the stuff is really going to take off. And if we quit, like, what are we going to do? We're giving up like quite a well-paid job to enter the space where there's a big opportunity, but um, it's super risky. So, and we also were like, we're not really sure what we're going to do exactly. Like, we're we just going to like buy and sell art. Like, is that really going to be um, uh, like a viable career? So we decided against it. And then in May, everything crashed. So we're like, hey, that was a good decision that we decided against it. Um, and you know, we both had some some time off work um, over the summer. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I had three months. I ended up having four months off actually because I ended up rejoining the company I left. Um, and that was kind of that that summer period really was like this huge crypto crash, but then you had this huge NFT boom that followed after it. So luckily, you know, we stuck around. And you know, I really wonder if I was still working, if I would have stuck around or not. Um, is one of those things where I just I had all this time off and I was in a place where there was like they just started going through lockdowns um so I really was like stuck at home with all this time off and um I, you know I really wonder if I would have been, gotten that engrossed in it if under different circumstances but um by the end of the summer like it got to a point where we you know we made a lot of money um f flipping NFT trading NFTs ETH but came back a lot higher again as well so um it was like it was enough we'd i think we'd like made enough to be like okay we're we can now kind of take the risk to quit our jobs and see if we can figure out doing something full-time in the space so by december 21 we we resigned and then by you know march 22 we'd officially quit um uh officially quit uh barclays um and i think we still didn't really know what we were going to do i think we were like okay let's just like Sell, take some chips off the table and just so we have like you know enough liquidity for like in real life stuff and then i don't know let's like keep buying and selling nfts but you know that's when we started doing different things like we had our dgens project which didn't work out very well from last year so like let's revitalize this and try and add some value to it we started doing rug radio at the beginning of the year which was you know nothing then we were like the only show to begin with um and we had no idea how how big that would become um you know i was drawing things on the side. And again, I was just kind of like doing that for fun. I had no idea how big that would become. So we never really had these plans to, we never had like, we, never, we weren't like, okay, let's quit Barclays and let's start DJs, let's start Red Guy, let's start Rug Radio, let's do this. We had none of those plans. We were like, let's just quit and take a take a leap of faith and just see where we can, you know, see where opportunities where we can fit into and, and, and give things a shot. So um, that's, uh, that's how it all happened really. This is risky, but definitely high rewarding. Like looking at you, uh, meeting you in person, understanding that the only way for you to realize the potential in this space, the only way for you to actually find uh, this potential in this space is to dive uh, fully with your hat. That's the only way, because theory, that's cool. Uh, witnessing other people winning and losing is perfectly fine, but like once you start doing this thing, uh, when you go, once you go through all these rock pools, uh, once you go through this first yeah. uh, X2, X3, uh, once you actually realize that it's real money, uh, can you remember like a year ago uh, when ETH was uh, like 4K, uh, almost 5K, uh, we were buying collections for tens of thousands because it was basically two ETH, two ETH collection. It's nothing right now. And right now you can buy the same collection for like, which costs like 10, 15, 20 East, but the price in fiat uh, is even lower. Uh, th this is crazy. You need to go through these cycles and definitely you coming from this traditional fi financial background is something that helped you. Uh, and the fact uh, that you've been in the space less than a year, uh, Basically, all these big OGs, like you take G Money, you take six, uh, Punk 6529, uh, you take even Farouk, all these guys came, what, like less than two years ago. 
it all started with Clubhouse. It then went into Twitter spaces, as you mentioned, like Rag Radio and Nifty Portals being uh, two first ones uh, to start their shows. And uh, it's still early right now, but those people who are from the beginning, from early days, those people who are going to stay there in the last 5, 10, 15 years, these people are going to be the true OGs uh, for others to learn from, for others to follow. And so I know that you, me, Mando, Farouk, uh, all of us are here to stay. Uh, this is really inspiring uh, for me to hear your story once, uh, what, what one uh, after another time, because that's something interesting. That's something for other people to learn from. That's something for other people to get inspired uh, how to uh, move into the space and how to succeed there. I do believe uh, earlier this year, uh, that was also the time when you decided, uh, you, Ben, Michael, that uh, can relapse is something that, uh, another project that we can uh, move forward with. As I already mentioned, can relapse, uh, it's basically an advisory company in this uh, financial aspect of Web3, in this uh, NFT aspect of Web3. You're the fourth biggest holders of uh, in ape ecosystem or uh, board apes how did you decide to start this company uh, was it like uh, let's do something with our apes let's combine those uh, and let's uh, have this as one of unique selling points so that people can actually understand with whom they're talking how we can help them how early we were there or it was something different in your case it was just like um, we wanted to name our joint collection that we both had collected personally and joined together. And we, um, where we used to work at Barclays is this place called Canary Wharf in London. Um, so we kind of named, named it after that. That's why we call it the Canary Collection. Um, and uh, yeah, like we, you know, when we started doing all these different things, we we're like, you know, it probably makes sense to have a company and have an umbrella, which where all these things fit into. And that's how I've decided to, to form Canary Labs, you know, later, later this, uh, earlier this year, we're like, you know, let's just, make this make this official and um and start doing it properly love it and uh talking about nfts like in general because we're already touching upon this topic uh right now uh, you entered the space you started being into it during this high peak of uh, bull market you remember like january february that was the real peak uh, it was the record breaking for activity on OpenSea. It was the record breaking for all these collections. Uh, you buying Kuman, uh, for example, uh, it making double of its price, which was already like one ETH by then. Uh, during just during the night, uh, I remember me making a couple of uh, transactions during the New Year night uh, when you need to be with your family. But just quickly, I'm going to buy you know, just coming back in a couple of hours uh, after the party and seeing that it's almost two X. That's something that happened back then. Right now, for people who are just entering the space, uh, summer, this autumn, it might sound crazy for them. No way it happened. Like I'm buying this thing and it's going down. I'm buying another one. It's going down. Where is the dollar cost averaging? What is happening here? Like the market right now is extremely volatile. The conditions are crazy. Like the open sea activity is going down and down. So let me know what is your take uh, on the whole uh, NFT ecosystem right now? What are you looking at uh, at this right moment? And uh, how should people uh, approach the space right now? Uh, it's basically uh, fall of 2022. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think, as you mentioned, last year was just, just this insane bull market, even the beginning of this year as well. And you could just buy anything and it would go up. And I think a lot of people maybe tricked themselves into thinking they were really good at this or got into a false sense of security and people were making like way more money than they were in their day jobs. They quit their day jobs to come do this. You know, we did the same thing. Um, and it was, you know, you have to differentiate sometimes like, is it because what you're doing is like this really amazing, skillful thing, or is it because everything is just going up and, um, we were in this environment, especially post COVID where like everything just did go up for, for a long time, for a good two years. So that dynamic has now changed for, for multiple reasons. And it just doesn't really exist anymore. That's not to say things don't go up. Like, you know, every so often there's something that does well. Um, but it's much, much harder to be 
successful and, and, and pick and choose the right things and pick and choose the winners. So um, definitely like right now, we've been less focusing, less focused on collecting things or, or buying things or, or, you know, swinging, um, swinging the bat, so to speak, and, and taking risk. Um, I think I'm really focused and we've been really focused recently on just buying things that we perceive to have like lasting historical or cultural value, like, you know, real pieces of art, real artifacts, stuff like, um, you know, some potentially some art blocks projects like Fidenzas or Ringers. I think some of the really old stuff like rare Pepe's, which are, which are so culturally relevant and very historical. I mean, some of that stuff dates back to 2016. Um, buying art from artists we think will actually become very big, like back to the original thing we started to do. I think there's a lot of like VC led profile picture project style things, which are trying to be web three brands for entertainment and that kind of stuff. And you know, I'm definitely wary of, of those projects um, because they've raised a ton of VC money and at the end of the day, they have to appease their investors. And it's pretty clear these investors have done the analysis of cash flows based on like how much money these guys have made from number one, primary mints, number two, secondary royalties, right? So the way that you keep that going is to basically issue more NFTs and issue more supply. And it's just very clear to me some of the projects, and I'm not going to like name names here, but some of the projects have taken that strategy, which means they're not going to be valuable. Like I'm not saying they're bad guys, but I'm saying they're just going down the the route of like, okay, we're just going to be like a Disney and sell you a bunch of merchant products and stuff, which is great. And it's fine. And I would consume that if it's something that I liked, but you know, I'm not trying to consume things that I like here. I'm trying to invest in things where they'll have um, capital gains and future value and, and things that will be like interesting pieces of art or digital collectibles to own. And I think anyone who is raising VC money and has the business model of just like selling you a load more shit, that's not going to, um, you know, that's not going to fall into that bucket. So definitely try to avoid that kind of stuff and definitely try to focus on things that will actually have collectible values. I know what I've just said is a little bit, um, um, what's the right word, like hypocritical, if you like, because we're also huge in the Yugo Labs ecosystem with like apes, um, other side, mutants, everything, like a lot of ape coin as well. Um, but that's because I'm not viewing that as a digital collectible investment. We're actually viewing that as a more like a company investment or a VC investment. And we also invest in the Yuga Labs seed round as well. And it's like, okay, like we're investing in Yuga Labs as a company and we know that they understand how to stream value to the original NFTs, the apes, they've got all the airdrops and all this kind of stuff. So like we have some confidence that those will maintain their value because they know how to play the game and we think they're going to be successful and we, we, we like the A16s they're backing. Um, something like doodles, for example, we don't have that same confidence or belief because they haven't, they failed to get the, the doodles, OG doodles, like above seven or eight ETH or wherever they are, or they have been for a long time. And they focus on just like more and more supply, all this kind of stuff without really valuing or re rewarding that part of it. So, and they're, they're taking all these other different avenues, which just seem like, I don't know how that value is going to stream to the original doodles. So, you know, it was easy to lose confidence in that um, for, for those reasons. So. These are the sorts of things we're thinking about, basically. But you know, like if I go out, go out there and buy a Fidenza, I'm really buying a collectible that I personally like, that I think will be historically and culturally significant, and will have a lot of value in 10 years' time. If I'm buying an ape or investing in a Yuga Lab seed round, then I'm kind of like backing that company to make a lot of money and do very well. Yeah. Wow, that is a really powerful investment thesis. Uh, from you so you're basically investing and I you just mentioned that it is something that you changed in your way of thinking not that long ago you're basically investing in this historical pieces something that's gonna accumulate the value uh, from this point on something that already proved to be stable strong and you're just uh, building during the bear market let's put it like this when I met you in London you said that was probably by then uh, you collapse specifically board apes was your strongest convi uh, con uh, the most convenient play when it comes to this utility based nfts like something that is not art something that is not art everything else like pfts utility based like you said that the most probably board api club is it still the case for you now and uh, if so 
why are you so uh, bullish on Yuga Labs apart from the fact that they already dropped uh, hundreds of thousands to long-term holders? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, I just think these guys are very, very smart. I think they created something that maybe at the time they didn't realize it was going to become that big, but at every step of the way, they've done really well to execute flawlessly and um, you know maximize the most of the opportunity. Now, when you get to a certain size and scale, like they have with the other side, and how much they're dropping and how much money they've raised and the valuation, you're gonna it's gonna be less. It's gonna be much more difficult to execute and deliver, and you're gonna be way more open to criticism and and fud and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that comes as, as part of the package. Like, no one that big has has done something without any form of criticism. Um, but I just think you can't really like. It's very difficult to fade these guys because they've proven that they're pretty smart and they know what they're doing. They have a good sense of like what will do well, and they have a very good track record of streaming value to the OG apes and to the OG holders. Um, they've done it time and time again now for um, for a year and a half. So, you know, I have zero doubt why any of that would change. And it's nice to see that they kept those values when they went and raised, um, uh, you know, went and raised VC money um, from, from A16Z. I think the other thing is that like A16Z are like the smartest guys in this business as well. They're, the, they're definitely probably, I think, the smartest VC, probably one of the largest. They just raised like a huge... 3 billion crypto fund or whatever it is in the middle of a bear market and i haven't seen many other funds doing that thing so these guys are really smart as well so that combination is really really hard just to fade these people i think they whatever they have cooking or you know whether they're doing it really is a bet on them to deliver and um i have a lot of confidence they they will be able to deliver and look acc that have huge deep pockets to support things and give things a, a runway for a long period of time so um, it's really, really hard to ignore and fade that. I think, you know, we started out by wanting to own apes because like, you know, they kept streaming value to all these OG holders, but I actually think ApeCoin is maybe the more interesting thing to have because that's where all these guys have their value, right? That's where Yuga Labs has their biggest position. That's where A16Z will have like a, a big chunk of, of money investment as well. That's where all the other investors have their position. So like they're probably incentivized to stream most value to ApeCoin over apes. The nice thing is there's only 10,000 apes and that's actually not that much in the grand scheme of things. Um, um, so they can still do both, but you know, it makes it interesting. And I think you've started to see signs of it. Like you start to see like um, Gucci accept ApeCoin. You, you know, there are like places in Miami Huge. where you can buy real estate with ApeCoin. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's just like, well, who cares? Like who's gonna go and buy a Gucci handbag with ApeCoin? No one, but it gives you a sense of like the strings they're able to pull. And, you know, we haven't, I actually think the bear market for them is, is great because it's given them time to build all the stuff and create all these things and develop all these partnerships and their biz devs amazing and set the, you know, put the, um, put the markers in place for when we start trending higher again. So it's been good for them to do it because it kind of really reduces the expectation um, T0. But I think, you know, whatever they have cooking for it, I think is going to be interesting. And I really think it's going to be, you know, end up being a top 10 coin basically. There is this new investigation that is happening around Yuga Labs. I do believe it's connected to ApeCoin as well, but I strongly believe that they're going to go through it. Nothing bad uh, going to happen there, at least uh, till that moment. The, the worst thing that uh, Yuga Labs did was this uh, mint war uh, that happened during the other deed. But uh, at the end of the day, yes, it could be done better, but uh, it's not a big problem at all, I do believe. Do you think that Yuga Labs, and in particular, I would say Board Ape, uh, not CryptoPunks, but Board Apes, uh, gonna remain number one in the next three to five years? I think so. I mean, it's hard to see what can overtake that. You have, I think Azuki is really an amazing project, and I think that team has done really well at delivering value to OG holders, building a real community with a real niche, and um it has a lot of like brand appeal out there to people so you know that could be a big you know a big uh, i'm sure they'll raise if they haven't already announced it i think that could be a big competitor uh you know lava labs are obviously out of the game because you Labs bought punks and me bits and i don't really see anyone else out there with the power to compete doodles raise a lot of money at a big valuation but I just you know i just don't, i just don't think they have what it takes to to do it, I think they've taken the wrong strategy, in my opinion, and that's reflected in the price. The other 
big competitor would be Clonex um, and Artifact. And I think that team is an NFT native team that's done really well since the beginning and, and built a big following. And now you have the back of Nike. So theoretically, you have a lot of capital behind that. And you have access to um, a huge fan or consumer base through that as well. So it's just a question of like, you know, what's Nike's angle and and so far it seems like artifacts have a lot of autocracy to kind of do what they want but what's the angle there are they going down the consumer route are they going down the collector route like what's going to happen but i think um yeah between azuki artifacts slash clonex and yuga labs those are those really the big three and um i still think it's gonna be tough to to knock them off the top spot and mutants as well still still to stay there still to be that strong Say, say that again, sorry. The... Mutants. Mutants. Are oh. they still stay strong or you believe that uh, it's all about uh, as a core core ape? Yeah, the club. Nah, I think I think I think mutants have a lot of value. Like um obviously it's not gonna give you the same thing as an ape, but you know, from holding mutants you got um you got an airdrop of other side land, you've got an airdrop of ape coin and I think you'll continue to get stuff it gives you access to if you're into the events and ape fest i mean i used to say this is the more affordable part of the ecosystem but <laughs> even mutants now are like 15 e for, for a 20k collection which is insane so um but you know like those, these guys know what they're doing they know their whole this whole thing they're fully aware that this whole thing is built on them rewarding their collectors that's how it's built that's how this brand was built and that's why people are so grateful to, to yuga labs and I think they fully understand that. And I just don't see why they would veer from that strategy. Since we're discussing with you a couple of uh, blue chip collections out there, what is your take on VFriends as well? On v VFriends, I think is interesting because it's like, it's kind of like a way for Gary V to, um, I don't know, create, like give his NFT following, um, give his own personal following like an NFT which then brings everyone together, whether it's like via social media and in a Discord, whether it's via VCon and his events. But it is, it's kind of like it is kind of like a very much so like a Gary V centered project. But if you go to VCon, there's a ton of people there, and it's a very interesting conference, and you can network and meet a lot of people. So, you know, I think it's just like another Web3 brand slash like community slash members club, if you like. Um, exactly. But it's just like it's the it's the Gary V brand, you know, and and he's the one leading it. He's the one involved in it, and you know he's done a lot of good stuff in the space, and he has a big following. So I think it's just you know he's let let me put it this way: like um, when someone like Floyd Mayweather comes in and just sells a bunch of NFTs, which are pictures of himself, which give you no connectivity with him, and um, he takes the money and runs away, like that's. I don't remember. Yeah, that's NFTs done wrong. That's not a good use of NFTs, and that's basically a cash grab. And someone like Gary Vee, who has a big following, like two or three million followers on Twitter, a big fan base, creates his NFT project, and that gives you access to interacting with him maybe in some form. It gives you access to VIP tickets at VCon. It gives you access to this Discord with a real community. Like, that's celebrities and NFTs done right because people are actually getting something out of it. And that's why that project's done so well. So I think there's a big difference there. And I, you know, I view that as a Gary Vee thing, um, but there's this you know, community around it and all the utility around it as well that you get to. And I do believe another good example of this uh, community driven access to caters, access to these events would be Moonbirds. Uh, I know that uh, Moonbirds yeah. are also about to have their uh, first big event. Uh, so, uh, and they also have this uh, smaller collection, uh, just like we brand series two uh, dropped one April of uh, this year. The same goes to Moonbirds. Uh, so I assume that the, you're approximately of the same uh, way of thinking about Moonbirds, just like we friends. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Moonbirds, I think I've never owned a Moonbird or, or a proof pass. And I've been back and forth on that project you know sometimes i've been very skeptical recently i've actually really liked what they've done and i think the idea for that is it, it seems like it's less of like a hey i get to speak to kevin rose kind of thing but i think what they have done with when they started the proof pass they seem to have, again like built a community of like um very smart people and it just seems like you know like if we take stereotypes like 
apes had the stereotype of like, oh, hey, he's a bunch of like, I don't know, like middle-aged men who love gaming and, you know, love drinking, going out and partying. And like, that's like the stereotype. I'm not saying that's true, but that's a stereotype. That's one of the stereotypes that's formed on Twitter. Um, proof the stereotype is like, oh, he's all, these are all these people who are like, you know, have high positions in Web3 or crypto or, or in their professional careers and um, a lot of OGs and here's a lot of, inter or, you know, a, a community of like people who have had a history of collecting art and, um, you know, uh, are smart on that front. Here's it. Let's put all these people together in the community and that's what you get from it. So I do see like the um, attraction of that. Do you want to meet, do you want to be in a community of more like-minded people? That's what all this comes down to. And these are just different types of communities. And, and I think that's what proof is. It's a different atmosphere and environment. I think that's why it did so well at the beginning, because you had all these people who were like, okay, um, you know, I, I bought this proof pass. I don't need to sell it. And I'm meeting really interesting people from here. Like this could be a really big thing. And I think that they've done that really well too. I got it. And I mean, you just mentioned the fact that uh, you're going back and forth, trying to understand whether you need this collection or not, uh, which is perfectly fine. Uh, you cannot be everywhere. Like Web3 space is so big and you need to also do some uh, research, as we say, do your own research to understand uh, whether it's a rug pull, whether you want to be a part of this community. And uh, at the end of the day, buying this collection uh, if it's not a collectible, if it's not something to stay there for ages, but buying some collection, utility-based collection, where you actually do not redeem your utility, where you actually are not an active member, most probably it's not that beneficial. Uh, some people prefer to uh, stay to smaller uh, number of communities, but be active there just to get the whole benefit. What would be your suggestion uh, from Ovi here today? Uh, what is the way not to be always in this formal uh, mode? Uh, that I'm gonna be there, I have to go to this conference, I need to meet this one, but actually stay focused on what matters to your investment thesis and uh, be more uh, relevant, be more active uh, in Web3 uh, that would bring you value, not just uh, mean buy, sell, uh, trade, uh, which is also perfectly fine. Some people are uh, finding this as this element of fun of Web3. But since you said, and uh, you're a big collector, you're an artist, you're a co-founder of uh, multiple brands in Web3, uh, you said that there is a lot of amazing collections like Moonbird right now in accordance to OpenSea volume uh, is listed number eight, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but you're not a member of it, uh, even though you would like to, but you were saying you're coming back and forth. How to make sure that you're not foaming uh, in all of these collections and all of these projects? Yeah, it's a good question. I think you need to just have a plan. You need to have a strategy, you know, and your strategy can be like, I'm going to just gamble and mint a bunch of stuff and spin the roulette wheel. But so long as you understand that it's a gamble and your strategy may not work, then that's fine. I think it's when people gamble, so, you know, they'll do a degen mint and they'll think, oh yeah, I should make money on this. And they'll get upset when they don't. Like that's tricking yourself into like thinking you're doing the right, you know, you're making smart decisions is the biggest, um, um, one of the biggest flaws I think people have in the space. And, you know, I'm not saying don't gamble and stuff, but I am saying understand and recognize that you are, what you are doing is a gamble. But then you also might do smart trades. You know, if you, if you have well thought out trades or investments and you have a strategy that you've written down, you have a game plan, it's cool. I'm only going to buy, I don't know, like art from artists that I think are going to be successful, it's whatever it is. Um, you know, you can do a bit of both. You can, you can say, cool, like 25% of my portfolio is going to be art. 25% of my portfolio is going to be like blue chip NFTs. 25% of it is going to be like DJ mints and gambling. Um, as long as you have like a plan in your head and you know, if it helps write it down on a piece of paper, that's something that I like to do because otherwise you get confused and the lines get blurred. But as long as you have a plan and a game plan, then I think it helps you to structure your thoughts and actions a lot better in a space that is quite frantic at times, even in a bear market, and there's a lot of different things going on all the time. If you don't have something structured or planned in, in, inside of you um, or written down, then it's going to be difficult to know what to do when something comes up and you're you're torn as to what decision to make. Um, so I think for me, that's one of the most important things I would say. 
and I highly appreciate you sharing it, uh, having game plan, uh, actually having this vision of what do you want to get from the space and how you want to get it helps a lot. Uh, like one question that just pop up uh, in my mind uh, when you were replying to this question. Uh, do you have a game plan of profit taken related to NFTs? Is it something that you're revising every week, every month, like uh, whenever there is this crazy bull run and you have, I know that you, just like any other Degen, including me, you were meeting uh, multiple NFTs, uh, one to hold, one to sell, another one to play. Uh, so do you have this game plan strategy based on weekly, monthly basis uh, with NFT uh, collections or uh since you have your businesses that you co-founded since you you have businesses that you have a part of and you also have royalties coming from uh, reg guys for example you're all good in sense of money meaning that nfts is more for you to gamble of this higher return uh long term or collectibles which most probably you're not selling in the next couple of years you're holding those for long term so what is your strategy when it comes specifically to nfts that you collect on uh open or any other platforms yeah i think um what i would say is we're not really we started out by trading nfts and doing dgen stuff we're not really doing that anymore i think anything that we buy nine times out of ten it's with a long-term perspective and of wanting to hold it for for a long time ideally for multiple years so we definitely change in terms of like how and what we're buying and, and maybe that's the reason why we we are buying more of this like art or historical kind of stuff rather than pfp projects um the other reason for that is because i think that stuff is on discount in a bear market and you know you can start when there's going to be there's going to be money to be made but there's no hanging through uh focus on carry labs and all the other businesses that we have and um trying to deliver value to those as well so the you know that takes up a lot of time and it's difficult to do to do both and i think that's where we're going to um continue to focus i would say we missed you for a couple of seconds, but I do believe that the main idea here was that uh, you've been uh, digging trading before, and now you are focusing more on this uh, long-term place. Uh, that's uh, why you are more enjoying this space and you are not trying to sell it uh, for quick profit, yeah. but you're actually uh, sitting on some money aside uh, that makes your life comfortable uh, while uh, you're exploring this Web3 space in more details on your side yeah that's right yeah and stories like this uh that actually inspired me a lot because you were one of uh, first uh this full-time dagens that i started following uh right after farouk and a couple of other guys stories like this it's something that inspires me and uh, a lot of people when going through twitter uh, for example your red guy confession is something that i've been reading uh like one after another when you got this hype i remember you you were retweeting every confession like every five minutes there was this period of time uh earlier this year so i was going through different confessions of different people uh and i always wanted to ask you what is your biggest confession of uh, in this web3 space what is the biggest win of yours uh the most tasty one, uh, the biggest, the most, uh, I don't know, the, the ones that you feel fu fulfilled, maybe not the win, maybe some uh, meeting with person, maybe some events that you attended. And what is the biggest this downturn moment for you? Uh, maybe it's even a funny moment uh, that you've been a part of, uh, but that is something to confess, that is something uh, to be a part of your story in Web3. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, the best thing for me was probably like going to NFT NYC this year. I went last year as well. Last year was not as big, but um, it was amazing this year because, you know, by this point, I think I'd already made a lot of friends within the Web3 space. It was cool to like hang out with people in real life and, you know, just going to some of these events, even our event for Rect Guy, just seeing hundreds of people there, enjoying themselves, having a great time. Um, it was really like, it was really amazing to see. It was really, I was just like, wow, like I can't believe we created this just from sitting on our laptops at, you know, at home or whatever and 
with just some I, just some ideas in our heads and it transforms into this, you know, just a few months later. So I think for me, especially our event in NYC for Red Sky was really like a, um, it's one of those moments you have to kind of pinch yourself and be like, wow, like, I can't believe like this is happening. Um, and on the flip side, in terms of something else, I don't know, like, um, it's difficult to say, like, I'd, I'd have to go, I'd have to say, I'd have to go back to the apes really. And just, you know, it's, it's just so funny how, like, I sold all of them within the space of a few days, made five or 10 times my money, which is like a, obviously a great return. And there's no other asset class in the world where you can be disappointed with like a 10 times return because, you know, I could have made a thousand times my, or 2000 times my money or wherever it was. Like, um, it's, it's pretty insane to, to be, to have a 10 X return dwarfed by that magnitude. And, um, yeah, I think I can't, there's nothing else I can really say that would, that would top that one, I think. And it just shows that some of the biggest players out there in Web3, they also make mistakes. So if you think that uh, uh, you're not a lucky trader or your time hasn't come uh, yet or whatsoever, it's going to come. Like for everyone, it comes at a different period of time. Like even you, knowing that this is going to be huge, but uh, mainly listening to your some uh, inner self, listening to Mando, like listening to rational way of thinking like i already made this 5x 10x it's enough of course you could risk it all and it could be higher it could be lower we know that it would be higher for sure but like uh, i mean that's something at least to be grateful for uh, because you made this money and uh, it was definitely a good way for you to enter this space uh, full time uh, as you said so it's something to remember and uh, also talking about nft nyc i know that uh, we both are meeting each other less than a week uh yeah. in london uh i'm coming to nft nyc we both are speaking there uh we both are um, hanging out there uh i want to congratulate you on your uh, rec show in london uh that sold out uh what like two hours uh before uh i've yeah. been following uh, when you had the seven tickets left when you had like 20 something tickets left so you did an amazing uh work i'm definitely coming to the event uh let the audience know a bit more about the event uh when is it happening what is going to happen there because i do believe that the podcast will be launched somewhere around this event Actually, 3rd of November, uh, that is Thursday, and podcast will be launched exactly on Thursday. So for those who will be able to come to this an hour and something mark in the podcast, they will know some alpha about the show. So give it to us. Yeah, I mean, we, um, we're doing something similar to what we did in NYC, where we, we rented a venue called The Box. So there's a, there's a box in London. The it's original a big, one. it's a, it's a huge venue because the last time I came to London, I had to wait for like two hours to get there to meet guys from, uh, artifact. Uh, it's a huge venue. It's, uh, I guess the top venue out there in London. Yeah. So it's definitely a cool venue. Um, and yeah, we, we, if you had, a, unfortunately tickets are sold out now, but if you had a wrecked guy, you had the opportunity to claim your tickets for free. It's going to be free drinks all night and you know we have the saying in the community what happens at the rec show stays at the rec show so that's uh, that's all i can say about the event you'll have to you have to be there and see it for yourself i have heard a couple of stories about uh, you and uh, mando hanging out at this uh, event so i'm extremely intrigued because uh, i've missed your show uh during nft nyc in new york uh, i'm coming this time uh, we're gonna party a lot i know that a lot of uh uh, a lot of London-based uh, OGs are joining us, as well as people from uh, all around the world. Uh, for example, Patrick uh, from Rag Radio also coming, also joining. So it's going to be really massive. But at the end of the day, looking at Rag Guy NFT, I do believe that we can call it as a utility-based. Am I right? Because today, uh, majority of NFTs we're discussing with you are is historical uh, pieces, but that guy is something that uh, allow you to have this conversation uh, with creators, with some of the biggest OGs in person. It allows you to meet uh, this in real life events. Uh, what is your future vision for Rag Guys? Uh, is it something that will be fully backed by utility? Is it something that you want to move uh, to this artistic 
uh, part or it is something that uh, will eventually become this historical piece? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I don't really view it as a utility NFT. Like, we've this is our second event. We like doing events because we just want to get people together in real life. That's the only reason why we're not trying to make money off these events or anything, and we pay for them from the royalties that we make. So um, I wouldn't view it as a utility PFP. I do view it as a historical slash cultural PFP because I think, um, look, 2022 has been a very difficult year, and the whole idea of Red Guys is it celebrates this culture of like you know, being down bad and losing money or having a tough time, whatever it may be, but also this ability and idea to stay surviving and kind of ride through it. And that's what this year has been about. And we never intended it for it to be that, but it just, you know, when we dropped it and with what, how we named it and everything that happened, it kind of just happened organically. And, you know, like I said, that we don't ever really plan these things, but when we see the opportunities and see a piece of the puzzle fit together, then, you know, we really work hard and pushing that narrative and, that's how I view it as. Like, I think there's not really like any other piece of art or NFT out there that celebrates this idea of like being wrecked so strongly. And, you know, you can say, oh, this only works in bear markets, but I think that's true. Like people get wrecked all the time in, in bull markets. This is crypto, right? People get wrecked all the time in crypto. You get rubbed, you, you know, FOMO into okay. things in bull markets and, and lose money. It happens all the time. And it's also part of the fun. Like, I, look, people lose money in, I never want to see that happen and and I feel bad for people who do and I hope it never happens to them again. But for the most part and definitely for me and, and my friends, it's like, okay, damn, I lost money on this thing. Like that was really stupid, but it's also kind of like part of the fun. It's like when you bet, do sports betting or whatever, there is this gambling element to it. And that's also part of the culture, I think. And there is this like, it, maybe it's an unspoken thing, maybe it's a spoken thing, but I do believe there are people out there who kind of like to lose money or enjoy doing it or enjoy this like feeling of um i don't know excitement of gambling or this feeling of electricity and um it exists that like, people are like that people live off that riding these hot like highs and, and lows and and riding this volatility and again like this is a collection that very subtly but also clearly kind of celebrates that or recognizes that and that's the culture that's surrounded it this this idea of the wreck culture so um genuinely really really believe like it will that narrative is something everyone can relate to in the space and i think it has a lot of legs really so the the real power for this is not for like us raising vc money or you know adding utility and adding an erc20 token and all this kind of stuff that's not where people are going to get this value people are going to get this value saying like like i how do you know you survived 2022 i bought a wrecked guy and and that's exactly that's what we're trying to push sounds painful but that's something that uh we need in the space right now during the bear market we need a bit more enjoyment we need a bit more fun uh not just this uh, strict financial uh things etc and actually the way how i uh found about rag guys is uh simply by me listening to rag radio uh i've been uh, one of the first holders of uh Rag Radio NFTs have been one of first listeners I do remember like when we had when we didn't have those thousands of people coming it was less than 100 I do believe something like this so I was there from uh, very very beginning and actually for those who don't know that's something that I share with you before uh, this episode I'm about to also become uh a host at Rag Radio of a yeah, European congrats. show. I appreciate that once again, together with our uh, common friend, uh, Hannah, uh, who is a wonderful lady in Web3 from London. Uh, so let me know uh, what is your narrative around Rag Radio, because you are a host, uh, you're a constant member of the team. And Rag Radio, I remember just from this NFT show, uh, NFT spaces, to the idea and now to the execution, uh, the RAG DAO, uh, all these consoles, sub consoles, the RAG token itself, it's growing really fast and it's growing tremendously. So what is your narrative for RAG Radio? What is, what's the future for RAG Radio holds and what is uh, OSF's role in RAG Radio's future? Yeah, I mean, look, as it stands, I'm a host on RAG Radio and we bought a lot of RAG Radio NFT. So um, you know, we're also large investors in it. Um, Mando's involved um, with advising Rag Radio as well. So he's working very closely with the core team to um, help in business strategy. So we're definitely very involved and, and deeply in the ecosystem. And with that, look, I think it's something that 
has shown a lot of consistency throughout a bear market. Like we've been doing a, a daily show every single day, pretty much since the beginning of this year. And there are very few other projects that can, you know, attest to that. And, you know, it's not like projects don't, aren't working in the background. Like I remember Doodles had a lot of criticism they hadn't sent out a tweet in a while, but they're obviously not doing any, they're obviously not doing nothing. They're, they're in the background working and stuff, but people don't see it visibly. It's hard to see it. And the nice thing about Rug Radio is because everyone's hosting these shows and on Twitter spaces, it's out there front facing. People have connectivity with you every single day and can see very clearly that um, that they're working on stuff. So um, I think, um, uh, you know, I think that's something that can be um, huge because of the IP and, and stuff that's developed, basically. Exactly. And I fully agree with you, me being like from almost day one, uh, I was regularly even listening to Farouk during uh, Clubhouse uh, spaces. I've been seeing this consistency day after day and the amount of shows that are coming uh, there, like the schedule itself that is growing, the ecosystem, uh, the next million of people who are onboarding to the space, that is also to a big part thanks to Rag Radio and Rag Radio holders. Because Rag Radio, it's not only the show. Rag Radio, it's all about people who are there, all those OGs, all those builders. And one thing that I love about Rag Radio a lot uh, is actually diversity uh, in the space. Uh, you have people from all different backgrounds, people of different cultures, uh, people of different genders. That's also why uh, our show uh, that we're uh, launching with Hana is called uh, Origins XYZ about uh, originals of different generations, uh, me as a male host, uh, her as a uh, female host. Uh, I would like to ask you, what are some of, uh, let's say, women in Web3 uh, that inspire you the most? Some of uh, those with whom you've been working closely or maybe those that uh, you're following, but those women who are innovating the space, those women who are contributing to the education, to the growth of the space that you uh, adore the most, that you respect the most. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, Sarah Zucker. She's an artist. She's an OG female artist um, who I think has pieces from 2017, 2018 on Super Rare. So I collected some of her stuff. I think she was a big like pioneer in some of this glitch art ideas and um, creating retro old school art, which I'm a huge fan of. So um, and she's really pushed that OG art movement from crypto art movement from the beginning. So huge fan of hers i've collected two or three pieces of hers um which i think is really awesome uh, i really like josie bellini as well she's also an og um uh artist and you know her project crypto brokers was was, was something a bit different and new when everything was on all the images were gen were on chain um so she's definitely developed things um from a from a different angle and, a, and an innovative perspective which i think um people appreciate so definitely those two are the first um the first two that spring to mind I love it. I absolutely love this uh, people, what they're doing for the space. So it's good that you name them. Um, I should say that I absolutely enjoyed connecting here today with you. Uh, yeah. You shared a lot of uh, insights. You shared a lot of uh, your background stories that other people might not uh, hear. Uh, I am fortunate enough to be connected with you personally. I'm fortunate enough to come uh, in a couple of days back to London to reconnect with you and uh, all other OGs. So we'll have another conversation there. But for other uh, people who would not be there, for other who would love uh, to hear, I do believe it would be fair enough to say that uh, I would love to see both you and Mando uh, back at my show later next year. Uh, once again, we're launching this show with Hannah. So I do believe you uh, coming from London will be one of the first guests uh, at our Rag Radio show as well. But you coming back, let's say in half in a year, uh, back to V uh, in Web3, what would be this one question that you would love to ask yourself to make sure that you're moving in the right direction or you're satisfied with your work? What would you, lo uh, what would you love to ask your future self? Yeah, I would say... Um... What I would love to ask is, are you still enjoying it? I think that's the main thing for me. And I think um, I started doing this stuff because, yeah, like you could, you know, maybe you could originally you could make a lot of money doing it. That's changed now, but I actually genuinely enjoy it because of the people that I've met, because of um, you're part of this like new revolution, it feels like, that I think is really interesting and feels exciting to be a part of. 
And sometimes you, you step into doing things which maybe aren't so enjoyable. And I think it's important to not spend too much time in them and, and try and cast something out, something out that you actually enjoy. So for me, like, you know, I want to make sure I'm always enjoying it. And that would be the, the question I'd ask myself. This is a brilliant question. There are so many things to enjoy in this space and you just need to find it. Uh, the way I would love to end our conversation here today is uh, with the tradition that I have on my podcast. Uh, at the end of each show, I ask all of my guests to imagine a situation uh, when you're stuck in an elevator uh, and it's like 15 to 20 seconds before you exit it, you're stuck with general audience. Uh, Web2 people has no idea about crypto, NFTs, blockchain. And you need to explain to them, to the general audience, why Web3 is the future. Why uh, would they love to join it? So what would be your uh, message to those traditional people knowing nothing about Web3, uh, telling them why it's actually the future and why they need to be there? Yeah, I'd say, look, um, what I would say is, um, remember when Bill Gates um, was, you know, was faded for all the stuff that he was doing. Um, remember when people were fading the internet. There's a, there's actually a very good, um, like newspaper clipping. I can't remember where it's from, but it's just like, you know, internet about to die as like number of users come comes down, and it reminds me of like all these articles you see now. It's like NFT is dead because it's like you know volumes down, and they just pick like two specific dates to show <laughs> to paint a story. Um, and you had that, you had that about computers, you had that about the internet, and you've had that about technology through for a long time. You had that about crypto and people aren't saying that about crypto now. You had it about NFTs and people aren't saying about NFTs now. People are you know on board to it. Every single brand, every single company and brand has like a web three slash metaverse like team now and they're trying to figure out how to enter this industry. So um, you know, like if you, you can sit there and, and keep trying to fade everything, or you can understand that. Um, or take some time to understand what this is all about. And it's a movement that's happening. And I, th I think no one can stop it from happening because it's just a technological advancement in my opinion. And um, I'm interested to see how it goes in the future. It's like Web 2, Web 3 comparison for those who have uh, witnessed this growth, uh, they should be aware of it right now. And if it's frightened, even if it's unknown, that's how uh, the internet started 20, 30 years ago. My friend, I absolutely enjoyed connecting with you here today. I do believe that uh, the next time you're on my show, uh, I'm going to add this small note to an introduction, not just an investor, artist, uh, NFTs, OGs, but actually a good friend of mine. I absolutely enjoyed connecting with you in London. I enjoyed our conversation here today. You're an extremely positive-minded person, open-minded to share your story, to share your expertise. and educate people to easily navigate in this Web3 space. And I do believe that's exactly what we need right now. When everyone is fatting uh, Web3, when everyone is afraid, we need those who will stand for everyone, those who have this uh, reputation and will show, you know what? Yes, it happens, uh, but also here are some of the benefits that it can bring us. And you're definitely one of top people uh, as them following there in the space. So thank you very much for uh, our conversation today and thank you very much to both of you, uh, you and Mando, uh, for what you're doing for this space. You're amazing, guys. Yeah, sure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, my friend. Enjoy it.